Hey guys, it's Luke Yon, and today I am going to be starting a very, very exciting video, probably my most anticipated video of the entire year, because I will be doing a reading vlog for All This Twisted Glory by Tahada Mafi, the third book in the This Woven Kingdom series. So if you were somehow unaware, the This Woven Kingdom series has quickly become one of my all-time favorite series. Tahada Mafi is one of my all-time favorite authors. The Shatter Me series is a series that I reread every single year. I'm obsessed with it, and I love all of her other books. I've read every single one of her books, and I have two other reading vlogs where I document my experience reading This Open Kingdom and These Infinite Threads, which will definitely be linked in the description box below so you can catch up on all of my thoughts on the series. I just reread the first two books in the series in preparation for All This Twisted Glory. I had to wait extra long to read this book because I wanted to wait until I was home to film a reading vlog, and since I am finally back for spring break, I can finally dive into this book, and I will probably read it in about 15 seconds. I want to put a massive disclaimer right now. This video is going to be full of spoilers, so if you have not read This Woman Kingdom, These Infinite Threads, and All This Twisted Glory, I would recommend you go read those books and then come back to, you know, see me freak out about this series. I'm going to be checking in every time I like hit a new point in the book um, and do like little recaps of what I read and my thoughts and everything. And so yeah, this will definitely be full of spoilers, so just take that as you will. But I cannot wait to read this book. I literally just finished rereading These Infinite Threads. Like, 15 minutes ago, so I can't wait to dive in. I have waited to know what is going to happen in the series for so long, and if you need just a little quick recap about the end of these infinite threads, we have Alize in Cyrus's castle, and there are a bunch of people storming the castle because they know that Alize is the heir to the Jin throne, and then we have Kamran, Hazen, Omid, Mishuda, and Dean flying off on Simorg, this magical bird, and her other children to go to Toulon to save Alize and figure out what's going to happen. So I know that in this book we also are going to be getting Cyrus's point of view, which is very exciting, but also strange because this is the shortest book in the series so far. It's just under 400 pages, and yet we have an extra POV. We'll see what happens. I've heard that this book is, like, um, the same sort of pacing as the first two books, but honestly, I don't mind that. I gave the first two books five out of five stars, so I will take whatever Tahada Mafi is giving us, and now we have confirmation that this series is going to be five books long, so I'm ready. I will be reading this series until, you know, the finale comes out, whenever that is. Not only, though, do I have this beautiful U.S. edition of All This Twisted Glory, I also purchased the U.K. Illumicrate Exclusive Edition. Of the book, and if you watched my This Woven Kingdom reading vlog, you know that I purchased the This Woven Kingdom version of this, and if you watched my These Infinite Threads video, you know that I was sad that I was unable to purchase it when the sale happened, but I did end up getting a copy, final, or like, you know, miraculously, I was able to like join a waitlist and then I got it and I talked about it in my like, one of my videos where I talked about like the most beautiful book that I received that year, and I hopped on the All This Twisted Glory sale the second I saw that it was it had started, and I'm obsessed with this edition. Obviously the front cover is beautiful, the spine, the back, but these are the sprayed edges, and I'm pretty much obsessed with them. We also have a pink, like these pink end papers, and it is signed by Tahana Mafi, so can't wait to add this to my collection. But yeah, I'm pretty much just gonna dive into this book right now, and I will update you once I've gotten a little bit of the ways through. I, like, genuinely cannot wait to see <laughs> what is going to happen in this book. Alright, so it has been a little while. It's probably around, like, 12.30. I did make my bed. I have not gotten out of my pajamas yet, but, you know, I'll do that in a little bit. But I did read the first hundred or so pages of All This Twist of Glory, and... No surprise, I'm literally loving it so far. So as is typical with Tahana Mafi, we pick up right where we left off in These Infinite Threads. 
um, but we do have a prologue at the start, and also this book is split up into parts, which is really cool, but before I even get into that, I do really, I mentioned this in my These Infinite Threads video, but I love the epigraphs that Tahadamafi includes in here from the Shock Nomad, there's two in here, and they do really, like, subtly hint at, like, what happens in the book, um, and I think they're really cool. But anyway, so this book is separated into two parts, and we start part one with an In the Beginning chapter, and we are following Cyrus as he is kind of on a walk, essentially. Uh, there's, like, an abandoned train tunnel and everything, and he finds this diviner who basically tells him, few can die, or many. Still a little bit vague, but then we pick up with Kamran as he, Miss Huda, Dean, Ahmed, and Hazen are, you know, on these magical birds heading towards Tulan, and Kamran is kind of just brooding, essentially, and he has a conversation about ha with Hazan later about, like, finding a safe house, and Hazan ran into Kamran's mother, Firaze, and she is trying to find a safe house and everything, and everything's kind of, like, in a limbo state at the moment, so that's where we pick up with Kamran, and as they are en route to Toulon. Alize, we find her in the aftermath of addressing all the djinn that had stormed the castle. We I actually really like how Tahadamafi did it because I feel like if she had we start like afterward and then Alize kind of recaps it and gives like glimpses into what happened of her just like addressing them. She says something about water because obviously jinns are or jinn are as established in the series very like their lifeblood is water, uh, even though they were created from fire, and so she says that and they all essentially disperse as she is still trying to make her decision about Cyrus, and she's following him, we don't really know where, but then we catch up with Cyrus, and he has actually gone to this, like, cave where the devil himself, Iblis, lords over, and we find out something very shocking. I was actually shocked that this happened, like, so early in the book, because it seems like a very big revelation, but I think it's going to be super important for the rest of this book and the rest of the series, so I'm glad it happened early on in this third installment, because I feel like at this point, we, like, needed a big plot twist, so I really applaud Tahanamafi for that, but we find out that Cyrus's father, who he has said to have killed in the first two books in order to take over the throne because he found his father unsuitable to reign too long, we find out that his father is actually alive and being chained in this cave by Iblis. He's, like, emaciated. He has no eyes anymore. It was actually really frightening, like, imagery. I was kind of like, oh, oh. like, it was a little bit, like, disturbing, but, you know, well written, of course. And we find out that he is being tortured by Iblis, and Iblis, of course, only speaks in riddles, and he says that, you know, there will be... He basically professes that, uh, or prophesizes, whatever that word is, that um, Alize will choose Kamran over him, and there will be, like, a whole... this whole situation, and we find out that like, Cyrus's father has, like, a debt to the devil, and that's why he's there, and that's why Cyrus, like, convinced everyone that he had killed him, and he's gonna try to wager against the devil to get his father back, to bring him back to his mother, all that stuff. He leaves, and then Alize had, like, a situation where she was kind of just, like, overcome by this devil, and he said, like, eyes, 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 eyes in her head, and then she wakes up, and Hazan, Ahmed, Miss Huda, Dean, and... Uh, Kamran are there, and then Cyrus appears, and Kamran and Cyrus have a showdown. Kamran shoots Cyrus with an arrow in his leg, and then Alize tries to help Cyrus, and then Kamran shoots Alize in the middle of her back, and then Alize and Cyrus fall. That's where I ended up. So far, I am actually really, really enjoying this book. It's super fast-paced and intense already, which I was not expecting, but since this book is separated into two parts, I guess I'll try to read part one today and part two tomorrow. Part one ends at around, like, page 200, so I'll definitely be able to get there by the end of the day, and I might even decide to read on, I don't know, but so far, this is exactly what, it's ex what I was expecting. It's moving a lot faster than these infinite threads. I think what where we've gotten so far is, like, what I had been expecting towards the end of these infinite threads, but then it ended, like, before we got to that, so I'm, ex I'm glad that it happened, like, right away because these infinite threads was a huge cliffhanger and there was like a lot that was sort of up in the air, so I'm glad it's all being addressed now. And yeah, I'm just really loving it so far. Like, I love the writing, I love the characters, I'm super interested to see what happens with the romance. I'm pretty sure she's gonna pick Cyrus, 
but I don't really know what's gonna happen with Kamran. I think he might end up with Miss Huda just because he's had some weird, like, thoughts about her and, like, he's been overly analytical about her, um, so far in this book, so I'm interested to see what happens and if we continue to get his POV throughout the rest of the series. Um, we shall see. I'm, it's giving a lot of, like, Julia, Warner, and Adam, so... I don't know. Tata Mafi is definitely establishing a track record. Yeah, I genuinely have no idea what's going to happen next, but I'll probably update you once I've gotten like 50 to 100 pages further in the book. I'm just really excited to finally be reading it, and I really want to figure out what's happening with the Book of Aria because it says like, melt the ice and salt, braid the thrones at sea in this woven kingdom, clay and fire shall be, or something like that. I, I want to know what's happening with that. I'm sorry also that the lighting is like changing so drastically right now. I don't know what's going on, but um, it's probably about to rain outside. But yeah, okay, I'm going to go before I'm entrenched in darkness, so I will see you in a little bit. Hello. So I'm kind of just having a lazy day today, as is evident by me still wearing pajamas at... 2.30, but I mean, I said this earlier, I made my bed, that's like good enough, I'm on spring break, so, you know, I can kind of just relax, but I also have a reading update, I am now on part two of All This Twisted Glory, of page 207, I don't feel like putting the dust jacket on, so you can admire this pretty purple hardback um, underneath with the really cool silver foiling, but I'm actually going to put the book down because... There is much to discuss. <laughs> so basically where we left off, Alize had been shot with the arrow, and then basically there was all this stuff where uh, Cyrus essentially called one of his dragons named Kava, or Kave, it's K-A-V-E-H, so however that's pronounced, and he, it's really cool apparently, he can communicate with his dragons, like through the mind, which is a really interesting aspect of the story. So we he tells the dragon to bring Alize to the Diviners. Obviously Cyrus is banned from visiting the Diviners because of the whole Iblis situation, so he sends Alize and the dragon alone to go to the Diviners, and Alize's pretty bit pretty much been checked out <laughs> this entire like section. We haven't had a single POV from her for like over a hundred pages, so hopefully in part two she'll come back, I guess. But we had Cyrus being brought back to the palace, um, and he was brought to like a bunch of the healers, and then Cy uh, Kamran and Hazan and Huda and Ahmed and Dean met Sara, who is Cyrus's mother. They had a whole like discussion and everything. A lot of this section has been like just conversations, which is totally fine with me. Um, I think it's really interesting, and there was, like, too much to recap, but basically they are just having, like, different conversations about the state of things, about Alize, about Toulon, about Ardunia, about prophecies and such. Kamran is, like, convinced that the prophecy, or, like, the inscription on the back of the Book of Arya about, like, weaving together the kingdoms has to do with him marrying Alize and all this stuff, and basically in the middle of this, Cyrus has another one of his nightmares where he is just being, like, possessed by the devil, essentially, and he imagines Alize. It's very steamy. Um, I had, like, seen on, like, TikTok and BookTube, it's, like, all the Twisted Glory chapter 14, and I definitely understand because it is very spicy, that scene, but it was all you know, a figment of his imagination, just like another way for Iblis to torture him. And so when he comes to, he storms out, you know, through the castle, he leaves his healers, and he goes to the meeting room where Sara is with, you know, the whole group, Kamran and all of them, and he's basically like, you know, Alize is, like, you. it's just like this whole thing, and they basically argue about a ton of stuff about Ardunia and Tuan and just a lot of, like, political and interpersonal things, and then, uh, obviously, we also learn that Cyrus is not allowed to speak about his deal with Iblis. He's not allowed to say, like, oh, it's because my father is being chained and blah blah blah, that's why he had to create the lie about killing his father. Um, so the only other thing that knows is Kaveh, the dragon. Um, but 
Cyrus basically reveals that the inscription that Kamran and Hazan found in the Book of Arya is a fake, and that that is a duplicate copy of the book, and that Cyrus has the real one, it has the real inscription and the real prophecy, so basically all of Kamran's like ideas about the melt the ice and salt, breed the thrones at sea, in this woman kingdom clay and fire shall be, are false, or you know, just not fully accurate. Hazan also informed them that if Alize ends up like taking the throne and becoming you know, or fulfilling her destiny as the lost queen of the jinn, then millions of jinn will, you know, go to wherever she is to praise her and, you know, swear fealty to her. And so that is kind of where we leave off, but where we finish part one, like, for real, is when the, like, someone comes up to where they are and says that there are a trio of diviners waiting to be heard from. So now we have entered part two. There's it starts out with another in the beginning section, so we'll see what happens there. I was not expecting to read so much of this book today, but I literally like can't stop reading. I just need to know what's going to happen, and I'm really enjoying the stuff about the prophecy coming together. I just feel like I love the way that Tahir Mafi is like slowly building this series and like slowly chipping away at the story. It's really great. I love the slow burn, and we are definitely, like, amping things up. Like, definitely faster pacing and more promise of the premise than the first two installments. It's just, like, this is the true middle book of this series, and I'm super excited to see what happens. There was also, like, the funniest line in this entire series. Uh, Hazan was basically talking about, or to, well, Hazan, Kamran, and um, Cyrus were all talking about how Cyrus wants... Alize to marry him so that the devil will, like, be fulfilled or, like, satisfied or whatever, so that Cyrus is broken from their contract and then Alize can kill him, and how he's willing to swear a blood oath to, you know, show that he is not gonna renege on his stipulations or whatever. And so, um, they were arguing about how the blood oath is, like, a really dangerous magic, it's dark magic, and how it's unreliable. And Hazan was like, how do you know, like, how are we supposed to know that you won't, like, force Alize into consummating the marriage with you? And Ahmed, who's, like, you know, a young boy, like, turns to Miss Huda, and I love their relationship, it's really cute, like, she's, like, his older sister in a way, and he was like, what does consummate mean? And she was like, oh, like, we can talk about that later. I just thought that was really funny, and it was just, like, a great way of inserting humor into a very serious conversation about, like, the fate of the entire world. Part one has definitely been a wild ride. I, I don't know why people are saying this book is slow. Like, technically, yes, like, not a ton of plot has actually happened, but I feel like we're making a ton of headway for, like, the overall series. And especially with the characters. We've had a lot of reveals so far, but I am super excited to dive into part two, and I don't even know what's gonna happen the next time I update you, so... Stay tuned, I guess. Okay, so it's a new day, new pajamas, but the same book. So, um, I did read some more yesterday after I last updated, but I went with my parents to, like, a different town. We, like, walked around, we had dinner. By the time we got back, it was, like, dark out, and I just kind of wanted to, like, hang out and, like, watch TV instead of like, updating it, especially if it was, like, dark out, the lighting would have been terrible, so I read, like, another chapter this morning, so I just thought I would do, like, a bulk recap. I'm currently on chapter 23, so I'm on, like, page 280-something, so I have about just over 100 pages left in the book. And where I left off, I just finished part one, so we moved into part two, and I am loving what Tata Mafi did with part two. In the beginning, I was not sure how I would feel about it, but I think it was the perfect choice for this story. Um, there was only one, like, part that I didn't love about it, but um, basically we start part two with another one of the in the beginning sections, and we kind of just follow Cyrus as he is dealing with, like, this diviner named Rostam, who I know is another character in the Shachnameh, which is kind of, like, one of the inspirations for this series. And he basically just, like, gives Cyrus some inspiration and, like, 
It's not super eventful, but it's nice to see into Cyrus's backstory a little bit. And then we jump into Alize. Finally, <laughs> we had like over 100 pages of her just being like totally pieced out. But we find out that she has awoken. She's in the Diviner's palace, I guess you could call it. And um, she is like in this strange room with all of these roses and like she doesn't know what's happening and then Miss Huda ends up coming in and at the beginning I was like this seems like it's a dream or something or like someone is shape-shifting as Miss Huda. It was not that. It was not as dramatic as that but I feel like that could have been like a cool plot twist. I don't know. I feel like that would have really overcomplicated things but um we find out that Alize has been asleep for like four weeks so we have a time jump in part two which, in the beginning, I was like, ugh, I don't really know how I feel about that, because, like, Cyrus had his whole conversation, or, like, had, there were the three diviners that came at the end of part one, like, what's going on with that? We do get a little bit of a recap for that, and I'm honestly glad that Tahana Mafi did the time skip, because I feel like we would have just slogged through that month that Alize was, like, checked out, and it would have been kind of boring. I would have liked, like, a scene here or there of, like, her, like, even her dreamscape or whatever, like, while she was asleep, like, what was happening there. But I understand why Tahana Mafi did decide to do that, like, skip to when she ended up waking waking up. So Miss Huda is kind of just recapping Alize about the happenings and everything, and then Omid and Dean end up showing up, and they have this whole conversation about, like, what's happening with Hazan and Kamran and Cyrus, and there was, like, a weird thing where, like, Alize misheard something. I can't remember who was talking to her, but they said... Cyrus, but I think they were talking about Kamran, and I was like, that kind of piqued my reader senses, because I was like, okay, there's no reason that Tahada Mafi would just, like, randomly include Ali's name mishearing something, like, there has to be something else there, so that was in the last chapter that I read, so it's definitely gonna come back, I think, and uh, we also learn when we are in Cyrus's point of view that there has been, or that a Jin uprising is imminent, and there are tons of jinn flooding in from all of these different, like, parts of the world. And I really enjoyed it in this section that I've read so far, like, getting to see more of the world expand. Like, we've seen a lot more, or we've heard of a lot more empires. We're learning about more of the places in this world, which is really fun because so far we've been pretty much exclusively learning and in Ardunia and Toulon and that's it. So I enjoy getting to see the wider scope and we did get an excerpt from the Dafdar which is like the Ardunian <laughs> gossip column basically and they're just talking about how a ton of jinn are going to, you know, have an uprising and try to find Alize and everything because she's the long lost queen, all that, all that, you know, Typical teenage stuff. We also find out that Cyrus, we like, there's a confrontation between Cyrus and Hazan because uh, Cyrus has the Nosta that Alize used to have, and he is like, uh, goes up to Hazan, and Hazan's like, How do you have that? Like, I gave that to her. And he's like, That's a great question because this is actually mine. And they have this whole conversation about it. And then where I finished, I know I'm like going all over the place, but we find out that um, these diviners have just randomly come up to Alize and they bow before her and then vanish. And Dean and Ahmed and Miss Huda are like, Alize, you are a diviner. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, the diviners bow to no one, like not even royalty. So there's something about you that, like, there's a reason why they're bowing to you. And, you know, we don't know what it is. But, like, we kind of do, basically. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's where I've left off. I'm, like, you know, chugging along in the book. I really don't want it to end because I know I'm gonna have to wait, like, a year until book four. Although, honestly, I'm kind of glad I did wait, like, an extra month to read this book because now I don't have to wait as long for book four. But now that I said that, I actually will probably have to wait because I will want to do another reading vlog and I'll have to wait until spring break. But, you know, it's fine. So far, I'm really loving this book. I think it might be my favorite in the series. I don't really understand why people think that this is, like, slow, because I feel like we are learning so much about this world and, like, about the characters. We've had a ton of development with the characters, learning so much about Cyrus. There's been a ton of reveals. So I think this is totally a crucial book in the series. I understand people 
maybe taking umbrage with the fact that there's not a ton of plot. Like, throughout these three books, there haven't been, like, huge major plot points, and they've all been pretty slow going, but I really enjoy it because I like the writing and I like the slow, like, peeling back of information. So I'm very excited to see where this book goes, like, how it's going to end, what's going to happen there, and how it sets up for the next two installments. I think it's currently 10-12. Um, we're going to lunch with my grandmother because it's my last, like, full day home before going back to school tomorrow, so that will be really fun, but we're going at, like, 12-ish, so I'm gonna try to get to page, like, 300 or 350 before we leave, and then... I will finish the book once we're back. I am so excited to see what's going to happen. I'll definitely update before I finish the book, um, probably when I come back from lunch. So, yeah, I'm super, super excited to figure out what's going to happen, and I can't wait to talk about it. Okay, so it literally has only been like an hour, but I already have a reading update. I decided to read after that clip, after I had like my coffee and everything, and I'm just checking in because I am on page 345 of All This Twisted and Glory. I'm on chapter 29. So I have just over 50 pages left in the book, and I thought that I was going to be able to just like leisurely make my way through the book throughout the day, but I'm probably about to finish it like right now, so I thought that I would update before I do so. Um, I'll probably. I'll probably finish the book, like, after I film this clip and then update after lunch when I have processed all of the happenings. Basically, Alize and her friends were, like, just talking and then they hear, like, these chants from the people that are outside, like, the... I don't know if they are jinn or just, like... I think they are jinn. Um, and they were outside and she goes to speak with them and then she gets hit by a dagger and they're like, girl, what are you doing? Like, stop getting injured. And then Kamran shows up, and he and Alize go on this carriage ride and discuss everything, and Alize basically tells him that she no longer has feelings for him, and that she has planned to marry Cyrus, and he's like, oh yeah, like, I knew that, but like, why can't you marry me after you kill Cyrus? And she's like, I don't know, like, she doesn't know what to do about killing Cyrus, because like, that was the original plan. And she's like, I feel like you care more about Toulon than you care about me. And they had this whole conversation, and then it just, like, cut off, like, at the end of the chapter when um, they, like, noticed that Cyrus was, like, over there, and then Cyrus was in his room, and Alize came to talk to him, and he was, like, telling her that they should get married as soon as possible, and they can do it very quickly. They can do the blood oath without any diviners or anything. He can perform the ceremony by himself, all they need is witnesses, and so that happens, or that conversation happens, and then she, he's like, meet me in the library, so he goes, or she goes, and talks to Puda and all of them, Kazan and Kamran shows up and everything, and the, right where I left off, she basically says like, says, yes, Alize said distracted, yes, we should go, we're going to be late, late, Kamran and Huda turn toward her at the same time. Beside her, Hazan stiffened. Late for what, your majesty? So, yeah. Very hard to stop at that point, but I wanted to update you all on what happened in the last, like, 50-ish pages so that I can finish the book and then discuss it all with you when I come back from lunch. So yeah, I'm gonna read this, like, literally right now, finish the book, and I will take some time to let it sit before I discuss my final feelings. Alright, so it is three something, I think, and I finished the book, I went out to lunch with my family, and I have reflected on and culminated my final thoughts for All This Twisted Glory by Tahita Mafi. So, um, basically I'm giving this book five out of five stars. I don't think anyone is surprised with how much I've been, enjoy I've been enjoying the book recently, or like in these clips, and then also, just, like, how much I love this series in general, but I'm going to talk about what happened in the end, and then my final thoughts, like, on that section and just the book as a whole. So, in that section, it was pretty much just dedicated to uh, Cyrus and Alize fulfilling the blood oath. And then at the end, 
it's kind of unclear, I think, to both us and Cyrus, like, what is truly happening, but basically Alize comes to him and says that she is going to make the devil regret the day he was born. And so, that is the cliffhanger we leave off on. I'm a little bit upset we didn't learn more about the Book of Arya because Cyrus, like, told Kamran that, like, the one that he found, the inscription that he had discovered was just, like, a replica. Um, or a decoy, I think is what he called it. So, I n I suspect we're going to learn more in book four. But I am just starting to get, like, so far in the series, get a little bit frustrated with, like, the lack of, like, information. We did get a lot of reveals in this book and answers about Cyrus and his deal with the devil. I would have liked to learn a little bit more about his father, but I think that's going to be... Uh, developed a lot more in the fourth book. So overall, I can appreciate and love this book for what it is. Like, I think it's a great installment, and it is very much like a middle book in the series. Like, I think we moved on from the arcs that were kind of established in books one and two, um, and we're setting up for what's going to happen in books four and five. So I think this was a very good, like, heart to the series, if you want to, like, call it that. And I really loved it, and I'm definitely going to be thinking about it for a while, and I just cannot wait for the fourth book. I have a feeling it'll be called, like, All These Braided Thrones or something because of that prophecy, but it might be something else. I don't know. I don't really understand the titling pattern of this series, but just, like, overall thoughts, like, on the writing. I loved the writing. I loved Tahanamaki's writing, just her prose is so refreshing every single time, and especially in this series, it's very much, it's very, like, decadent and elegant, and I love, like, just her writing style in general, um, and then it's very, like, I love the dialogue between the characters, I love the character development in this story, we learn so much about our, like, main crew, um, and even a lot of the side characters, like Hazan, like, he definitely has some stuff, happening. I have a feeling he is like some sort of high djinn or something because he just seems to have a lot of secrets. So definitely want to learn more about him and his situation. And then with Alize, I, I don't even know. Like she is very, very interesting, but I also just like, and I, and I appreciated like her steadfastness in this book and also just how set she was in her decision. Like, she knew that's what she had to do. Kamran, we'll see what happens with him in the next two books. I'm still kind of on the fence about him after this book. And then the other characters are pretty cool as well. And then I obviously love the setting of the series. Like, it's one of my favorites. I love the Persian-inspired, like, aspects to the story. I really want to read the Shafnama one day. And I just love Toulon, like, we spend the entirety of this book in Toulon, so it's the first time in the series that that has happened. We have not seen any of Ardunia, which was a little bit sad because I do really like Ardunia. But yeah, super solid third installment, and I just really, really want to know what is to come. I think it's a little bit, like, harder reviewing a third book in a series when I've done, like, standalone reviews for the first two, just because... Um, I've, like, touched on a lot of this stuff before, like, the amazing writing style and the characters and everything, so it's kind of just more of the stuff that I love, but all that stuff that I've mentioned that I enjoyed in the first two books, like, are present in here. It's just a little bit redundant to mention them, I think, sometimes. But yeah, I love all three of these books so much. I also love their covers. I mean, come on. Um, like, the covers, I think, just get better with every single book, and... I just, and even, like, their naked, like, hardcover cover colors are really cool, and I think the next book in the series will be mint green. I hope it will be, or it'll be, like, a blue type of color, but I think, um, either book four or book five will be mint green, and then the other one will be light blue to match, like, the pastel color scheme, I guess, but yeah, I don't know what my ranking for this series would be. I still, I just have, like, a special place in my heart for each of these books. Like, This Woman Kingdom, I think I love just because I've read it, like, so many times by now, and I love the setting and learning about the characters. I love these infinite threads because we get to see Kamran and Alize come into their own, and it's really the beginning of, like, the main story of this series, and then I really love all this Twisted Glory for the reveals and 
just like the setting up of everything and like the magic that we get a lot more of in the third book. So yeah, these are all super, super solid books and I can't wait to have the completed series and have the completed story in two years. But yeah, book four, I don't even know what's going to happen, but I'm pumped nonetheless. So that is it for my All This Twisted Glory reading vlog review situation. I really hope you all enjoyed and I would love to know what your thoughts on this book and this series are so far. But yeah, that is it for this video. I really hope you all enjoyed. All my social media links are in the description box below and I'll see you soon for a new video. Bye!